Hi, everybody. Last time I spoke to conference, it was reasons to be cheerful. I should have subtitled this reasons to be bloody miserable, I think. Um, no, there might be one or two laughs along the way. Um, okay. I've got quite a lot to say, uh, as always, so I'll, I'll make a start and I'll get right into it. And I'm going to start with a quote this time. Okay, here goes. It's very difficult to define a terrorist. For all I knew, he might well be an innocent Asian male. I didn't want people to think I was stereotyping because, he was, because of his race. I was scared of being wrong and being branded a racist if I got it wrong. I would have got into trouble. It made me hesitant. I wanted to get it right and not mess it up by overreacting or judging someone by their race. Now, I probably don't have to tell you, but that's from 2017. It's the testimony of Kyle Lawler. Kyle, as we know, was an 18-year-old security guard at the Manchester Arena on duty the night Ariana Grande played to thousands of adoring fans, the night 22-year-old Salman Abedi detonated a bomb packed with 3,000 nuts and bolts. Abedi was a Mancunian born in Manchester in 1994, but his parents came over from Libya. The inquiry into the Manchester atrocity, led by Sir John Saunders, found that they, Abedi's parents, were partly responsible for the radicalisation of their son. This was because they themselves held extremist views. That kind of extremism didn't seem to matter too much to the Home Office in 1993, when the pair claimed asylum in Britain. And God knows it mattered a whole lot less from 1997 onwards. Right up until the 7th of July 2005, in fact, the day of the 7-7 bombings, another atrocity. By then, you could argue, it wasn't a question of if, but when, someone like a baby would act. But let's just get back to this poor lad, Kyle Lawler, for a minute. Because much of what I'm about to say over the next 20 minutes or so is a response, albeit an di indirect one, to his dilemma. It's the easiest thing in the world, I think, to blame him for keeping quiet. But if I'd been a teenager on minimum wage, made to understand that I was privileged because of the colour of my skin, would I have spoken out? No, in all honesty, I don't think I would have done. I would have thought to myself, as he did, I can't say that, people will think I'm racist. You only have to remember the aftermath, the reaction to the atrocity. You only have to remember that to gauge the public mood. It was all asinine poetry and bittersweet pop songs. Don't look back in anger, even when 22 innocent people, mostly young girls, have just been brutally slaughtered. Don't look back in anger, even when hundreds of innocent people, mostly young girls, have been maimed and traumatised. You see the problem? When, as a society, we most needed freedom of expression, to work things through, to understand, to come to terms, we found ourselves lost for words. So, here and now, in 2023, with our borders in chaos and a general election on the horizon, maybe it's time we ask some searching questions. And I'll give you a few starters for 10. Here's one. Why did we lose our confidence? And how do we get that confidence back? And specifically, how do we discuss mass immigration and its inevitable byproducts, extremism, political correctness and rapid social and cultural change. How do we talk about those things in a serious, sober, fair and effective way? Before I go any further, I should say, make something clear. I'm from an immigrant background myself. I'm the son of a political refugee and I'm perfectly happy with reasonable, tightly controlled 
numbers. But we're a million miles away from that optimal position. Three decades of open door policy has led to nationwide crisis of purpose and a deep rooted culture of self censorship. In so many ways, the most extreme of which I've just illustrated with Carl Lawler, it's a terrible conspiracy of silence. We talk about immigration in terms of net and gross, and other speakers have said this. Gross is the raw number of people migrating into the country. Last year, it was 1.2 million. Extraordinary. The net figure, the in and out balance sheet, was over 600,000. This year, it looks like topping the 1 million mark for the first time in history. That's mass immigration and then some. Not surprisingly, we found ourselves long ago, as Rafe has just said, in a position of super or hyper diversity, which of course is not our strength, it's our challenge, and now I can say it's our weakness. In order to deal with hyper diversity, the government talks of fundamental British values, and it's done this for years. In 2014, for example, schools were told that they had to promote these values. They are democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance. God knows that's an innocuous enough list. But here's the problem. We are offering a home to millions and millions of people who fundamentally oppose every single one of those values. You can't help but feel the situation is a little bit crazy. Crazier still is the hate crime legislation which underpins those fundamental British values. Now, I always knew this hate crime legislation was well, it was daft, basically. Blinding you with science there. I am an academic, after all. But I'd never read the actual wording before. Have you? Has anyone read it? It's a glorious bit of nonsense. Okay, I'm quoting again. Yeah? A hate crime is defined as any criminal offence which is perceived by the victim or any other person to be motivated by hostility or prejudice based on a person's race, religion, sexuality, etc., etc. That's a race crime, hate crime. A hate incident is any incident which the victim or anyone else thinks is based on someone's prejudice towards them because of etc., etc., etc. Three, evidence. Evidence of the hate element is not required. <laughs> Evidence of the hate crime is not required. I was trying to think of an analogy and I couldn't really think of one. The, the best I came up with was winning a lottery prize and swearing blind that you don't need the evidence of the ticket. I perceive I've won. How dare you want evidence? It's all subjective. I perceived this. I thought that. You can't say that anymore because I'm offended. Close down, shut up, or face the bloody music. It's difficult. And again, I was racking my brain, but I can't, maybe uh, delegates could tell me afterwards, but I can't think of anything that's more open to abuse. Uh, especially, and I think this is the point, in a dominant culture which seems increasingly to fetishize equality of outcome, equity in other words. We live in a society that allows extra latitude to some because they are seen to start from a disadvantage. Well, we all need a leg up every now and again, but what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that hate crime legislation undermines the very values it serves to promote by discouraging close scrutiny of certain groups. And it just so happens that significant numbers within these groups have no interest in mutual respect or tolerance, let alone the rule of law. This was the case in Rotherham, Telford and Rochdale. Just as it was the case in a migrant hotel in Liverpool earlier this year, and migrant hotels all around the country. Our intellectual climate then favours censorship. You keep stum, and we can all rub along together. 
And the price we pay? More young girls. I use the word intellectual climate there. And let's just stop and think about that intellectual climate for a moment and rename it. Because in many ways, it's anti-intellectual. It's an emotional climate. It's probably best summed up by one slogan, chanted at marches, born on placards, emblazoned on t-shirts. And that is, all refugees welcome. The people who use that slogan also use words like kindness, empathy, ethical, and values, all highly emotive. It's the language of the activist, sure, but it's also the idiom of the institutions. It's everywhere and it's hugely influential. We're bullied by aggressive calls on feelings and subjectivity. This results in two things, two methods of shutting down discussion, two ways of curtailing freedom of expression. One, scapegoating. We're all familiar with this because we're the people who say, hang on a minute, let's call a halt to immigration. And as a consequence, we're automatically branded racist. We're ridiculed and looked down upon, called gammons, Karens, Little Englanders, white supremacists. All societal ills can be dumped at our front door because we are, quote, creating a hostile environment for incomers, unquote. Now that's a kind of gaslighting, yeah? And it's connected to my second point, okay? So we've got scapegoating. We've also got fantasizing the public realm of unreality which we are forced to inhabit. It's to do with representation. In the media, the academy, the civil service, everywhere. And it revolves around this idea of negative stereotypes. Seemingly, the only way we can avoid these negative stereotypes is to deal exclusively in ridiculous, cringing, impossibly positive stereotypes of minorities, of course. The latest iteration of this trend, I don't know whether you know this, the latest iteration of this trend is the refugee flick. That's one to avoid. I would point you in the direction of Ken Loach's latest film, The Old Oak. It's a classic example. Now, you're not going to thank me for pointing you in the direction of Ken Roach. And to be fair, I don't think I've ever done that in my life before, but I'm pointing you, so off you go. Okay, the refugee flick. I'm quoting uh, commentator John Wheatley, Wheatley here. He says, the refugee flick is a new genre in which metropolitan class elites tell clumsy parables about noble asylum seekers and racist knuckle-dragging knuckle Brits. That's what they're about. So, in this fantasy world of ours, the public realm, it's perfectly acceptable, desirable, in fact, to negatively stereotype white people of a certain age and political persuasion. I'm a gammon, you're a Karen, madam, the end. The first of those points, the scapegoating, is to shut you up immediately. The second is to do so more subtly and over time. It's the same basic principle. You're still a Karen. I'm still a gammon. And look how unhappy I am, how uneducated, how ugly, how pinkly agitated, compared to all those beautiful, brave, and yes, noble women and children no fighting age men, of course, they don't exist in this world. Women and children risking life and limb in a dinghy for a better chance of a better life. And of course, people like me are now in the minority. We must be. We're never on the BBC or seen in adverts. We're disappearing fast and good riddance, eh? It's a fantasy world. It's a fantasy world. It's a world of false narratives. Now, many, many people of colour, and this is important, do tons and tons of great things all the time. Of course they do, and good for them. But they didn't build Stonehenge. <laughs> Do 
despite a claim to the contrary from a new children's book. Brilliant black British history. Yeah! Sounds like something from the Fast Show. Do you remember that? In black British history, great. Black history suit you, sir? Yes, that kind of thing. Okay. What does it add up to? To cope with rapid demographic change that comes from mass immigration, you have to create a new national mythology. You have to make sure the past looks like the present. In other words, you have to rewrite the inherited culture in order to fit your narrative. Needless to say, this doesn't sit at all comfortably with the truth. Neither does it sit comfortably with freedom of expression. It's an affront, but it's more than that. It's a drip, drip, drip effect too. It's happening so much, so often, and on so many fronts, many people just get tired of the fight. They're steamrolled. It feels futile. I'm seeing lots of heads nodding there. And yeah, yeah. And deep down, they're frightened. I'm frightened whenever I speak or write about this stuff. Because I know I'm a university lecturer, for God's sake. I know that I'm that far away from being cancelled every time I open my mouth. And it isn't just me, and it isn't just you, and it isn't our friend Carl Lawler either. Other people are frightened too. Indeed, in this respect, it isn't a huge amount of difference between an 18-year-old security guard from Manchester and, say, a world-famous public intellectual. Richard Dawkins was described by Piers Morgan as one of the most fearless and fascinating thinkers on the planet. And it's true, he's said some incredibly outspoken things in the past, but even he, lately, refuses to talk about Shamima Begum returning to Britain, refuses to talk about Salman Rushdie and his right not to be murdered in cold blood. It's that drip, drip, drip effect I was talking about. Dawkins can't say those things anymore. Why? Fear of retribution. Don't take my word for it. Watch his interview with Piers Morgan. Fear. It's written all over his face. Okay, to conclude, other speakers have offered and will offer practical ways and means of tackling mass immigration. I'm concerned with the second front, how we push back against being shut down in our everyday lives. I thought about freedom of speech and mass immigration an awful lot over the last couple of years. To me, it seems as though you can have one or the other. You cannot have both. These days, Etiquette dictates that you're not really allowed to say things like that anymore. But guess what? I just did. I just did. <laughs> and here's why. And here's why. I cannot, I cannot expect freedom of expression to be a given anymore something that I can pick up and put down whenever I choose, something I can leave to other people. If I don't use my freedom, such as it is, if I don't care for it and nurture it and guard it, it will disappear completely. Free expression of ideas and the fight for free expression are one and the same thing. Free expression of ideas and the fight for free expression are one and the same thing. Doing one means I automatically do the other. I have to be proactive. It's incumbent on me not to be quiet anymore, to have a thick skin, to be impervious to insults, to be courageous but measured and intelligence, intelligent in the face of cancellation. I have to write myself back into the narrative. I have to create and maintain conditions in which it is perfectly acceptable to voice valid and fair concerns about safety, change, culture and society. I have to do that. And so do you.
so do you. We have to do it together. And I'll say it now, I'm here to support you in any way I can as fellow members of the New Culture Forum. Let's support each other and let's make freedom of speech our priority. Thank you. I told you it would be bloody miserable, didn't I? <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, just a comment question. Again. Um, just, uh, uh, Hi. Um, over the last few years, I've been studying Islam and the corrosive effects that it's been having, and it's absolutely jaw-dropping. I have to say, I was astonished. My question is, how do we push back on this? Because if we do not do this, we're going to be taken over by Muslims. Uh, thank you very much. A uh, little bit further than the question that Tablo just added. Uh, Mr. Reif touched on the issue of segregation, and uh, you focused mostly on uh, liberal views, neo Marxism, and anti British values spreading like cancer across Britain. Uh, if the whole thing escalates, my view is that public will not be holding back for a long time, So, and the whole thing will uh, lead into a civil war. What's your view on that one? Thank you very much. Yeah, can I take, can I take these, these questions first? I think, well, to stop us leading into a civil war, okay, I think we have to take this idea of segregation and religious fundamentalism uh, very seriously. When I was writing this, I was thinking, oh, it's not in the news that much at the moment. Uh, but it could flare up and happen tomorrow again, okay? I think, I think there are gonna be more atrocities. I think more things are gonna happen. Um, I think we have to do all of the things that I said at the end there. I think we have to understand that we are a community of people. And I think we have to understand that we're the minority. And I think we have to stop being bloody silent, okay? I think we have to do what, and I think uh, one of the other um, uh, speakers said this before, we have to do something that's actually quite unnatural to us as social conservatives primarily here, and that's work together, okay. Uh, I was thinking about the GB News thing the other day and, and how all of those people just rallied together and complained to Ofcom, thousands and thousands of people who've never watched GB News, they just hate it, okay. And what happens is those telltale tits, those big mouths, those busybodies always win because they always do things, they're proactive. Now, I'm not suggesting we descend to their level, but what I'm saying is we have to understand the dangers to our freedom and we have to say, well, what are we going to do about it? We have to communicate, we have to organise, we have to be groups that will grow. And I think we're doing that at the NCF at the moment through the locals movement, which Stephen will talk about later. It's that idea of having a voice and practising with that voice. I'm really serious. If we don't speak out, if we don't say actually we're here and we're against this stuff we'll just get overridden completely overridden so it's not it's not a perfect answer because I can't just pour two chemicals together and make everything okay and avoid catastrophe but what we can do is start and to start we have to open our mouths and we have to do that I hate to use the word but we have to do it as a collective Hello, if you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme 
at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.